Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Not come on in. Not come. Sorry, y'all. Y'all know I'm weird. Whatever. Hey, everybody. What's up? It's your girl, Bondi Blue. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Hey, everybody. What's up? It's your girl, Bondi Blue. Okay, follow me on Instagram. And let's get into the video. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl, Bondi Blue, and I am very, very excited to come to you guys with the next Now That We Are Grown. If you did not know, this is a series that I do where we go and look at some of my favorite old movies from the 90s and such, and we revisit them. We have conversations about what they were about at the time, how we felt at the time, and how we feel now in comparison. OK, um, <clears throat> I think that off rip, I want to say that Tina Turner has been like and Angela Bassett both have been extreme <clears throat> inspirations to me in my life. Um, this movie was one of the first movies that I can remember really watching and I it over and over and over and over and over and over again. I know the movie by heart. I didn't even really need to make notes for this, but I thought I should just so I didn't leave anything out in my, you know, diatribe <laughs> that I tend to go on when I do these lives. OK, so off rip, I want to say that now that we are grown and I read and saw Tina's most not read. Yeah, no, I read the most recent book that she had. Um, I Tina, I think that's what it was called, and or Tina finding love. Child, I can't remember whatever it was. The last one was more so about her meeting her husband <clears throat> and and everything she's been through since uh the what's love got to do with it era, and the documentary as well. And what I understood from it all was that this was a very painful, painful time in this woman's life. It took up a lot of her life, and I don't think she's ever fully recovered from it. And she thought that when she came out with the book and the movie that she wasn't going to have to talk about it anymore. And then people started making it a punchline, and they made jokes about it, and they, you know, and they referenced it even to this day. You know what I'm saying? Like Glorilla has a, a anime line in her song, you know. Um, it, it has ceased to stop influencing the culture as everybody's go to domestic violence, you know, uh, um, joke. And it's not funny. And when I watched it back this time to make my notes for this, you guys, that is when I really watched it and I really saw it. And I really saw how much this woman was put through in her life. Okay, hold up. So I'm realizing I don't have a smaller graphic of this. So just give me a second. Y'all make sure y'all like the video as y'all come in. Okay, because we're going to get into it all, girl. But I want to make sure I have my smaller graphic before I come off screen, come onto the screen, girl. Okay, but yes, Um, now that I'm grown and I've watched this and I've really taken a look at it and thought about the way people made jokes about it. It really is messed up. It's so messed up, y'all. Everything that they say that black men do to black women was done to this woman in this movie. From working her like a mule, cheating on her in front of her face, beating on her. Like all of the things, like the, the work mule part is especially the part that I feel like we didn't really pay attention to because she loved being on stage. Because if you ain't on stage, you getting ready to go on stage. Hey, 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 hey wait, hold up. We're not going to do it because <laughs> y'all know I know this movie. So this is going to be a time and I'm excited about it. So let's go ahead and um, get into the notes of it all. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to see y'all. OK, um, the movie was a clean version compared to the book. And you know what? The first book I have yet to read and I'm, I'm wanting to read it like I, I want to. I was waiting till I got paid to buy it off Amazon um, because I want to read it. And I'm mad that it's not an audio book because my eyes are bad and I want to get through it quickly. Um, you know, but that's okay. And honestly, I might go back and read the book. And when I read the book, 
I'll come back and talk to y'all about what was in the book. But I already know that there are a lot of differences off rip. And when I remember to, you know, reference those as we go through. OK, we will. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that y'all like seeing me because I don't be knowing what I look like sometimes. <laughs> Girl, I be like, we about to get on camera and see. OK, they going to see before you see it. All right, let's go. All right. So. Y'all know what it starts off, okay? Hold me, hold my Jesus, hold me. He said it's better to let my, my little light shine. Okay, look. This little light of mine. That's what it starts. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Okay, listen, my right light, my little light, I'm gonna let it shine. Okay, listen, y'all know y'all gonna get some singing in this review. Okay, then. <laughs> in case you did not know, you gonna get some singing in this video. I have warmed up. I have taken a walk. I even did a little sprint back to the house. Bitch, I'm ready. Okay, so we start off in church. Uncle Phil's mama is leading a choir with both adults and children. Anna May is one of the littlest kids there. And she gets escorted out by Uncle Phil's mama by her ear. And she was still singing the whole way, ad-libbing the whole way. Okay? Let it shine. Okay, he said his man. <laughs> so let my little light shine. Okay, listen, she got kicked out of church. She couldn't have been no, no more than seven years old. And she walks home alone to her grandmama's house. And you can see from the distance, we don't see it close up, but from the distance, we see her mom gathering bags and her, her sister, Aileen, and getting them in the truck because she's leaving. And how you can hear the grandmama say, you can't leave anime like this. And she was like, it's going to be too hard to take care of both of them. And so she left anime with her mama and she left and you can hear her say, I can't let him beat on me no more. She said, I can't let him beat on me no more. So at the very beginning of this movie, what we find out about anime is that she was abandoned by obviously both parents left with her grandmother. Her mama was being beat by her father. So the mama has resentment towards anime because of who her father is, because her father was the one that beat her. Okay. And then the grandmama has to comfort her. But when she walks into the house, the house was in such a disarray that you know he must have really like. They must have really been in that bitch scrapping. They must have been in that bitch. They must have been in there fighting because the house looked a mess. And the grandmama is left there to clean it all up with anime looking like, you know, how could she leave me? And, you know, she was like, when is she coming back to get me? And grandmama says she ain't coming. She just ain't. So that type of pain starting off. Starting off life with that type of pain okay so let's continue on it feels like a 10-year difference okay 10 years later anime is on the bus to st louis to meet her mom and sister and her mom you know is referring to her oh no no, no. hold up her sister refers to her well she not my mistake aileen don't get fresh with me i'm not getting fresh mama what if what, what she look like now nah. Okay, she probably like that damn little good daddy of hers. Now, you said you wasn't going to start. So right now, you already know the mama probably have some resentment towards anime because she, you know, come from the damn no good daddy. Okay? And they really didn't recognize her. Had not seen her since she was a baby, so did not know what she looked like as a teenager. Okay? So she walked past them, and they didn't even recognize her. She was like, what, you don't recognize your own kid? Anime, Aileen! Oh, my God, is this her? Oh, anime! And then her mom says, come here, girl. Let me look at you. You ain't nothing but skin and bones, okay? And, you know, the hug is kind of uncomfortable. All right, well, you got you some bags, baby. You got you some bags. Oh, that big brama right there, you know? Listen, and then in the distance, we can hear her say, 
I saved all of your letters that you sent me, Aileen. So the mama wasn't really talking to her like that, but her sister was. So that's why even though she hasn't seen her sister in so long, they have a better relationship than her and the mama because the sister wrote her. Like, and you know that that mama felt guilt about leaving her, which is why she did not write her. Okay. So they get back to the house and it seems as if anime cooks them dinner because anime has abandonment issues. So she wants to make sure that she is of use in her mom's house so that she doesn't abandon her again. I understand this feeling very much so. Okay. So as she is putting up the dishes, her mama says, listen, hold up, sit down. Okay. I'm sorry for missing grandma's funeral. And then she said, you know, by the time I heard an anime says, yeah, I know. And she says she was too young to understand what was going on between her daddy and her. And anime said, well, Adeline understands she wasn't that much older than me. And then her mama leans back and says, well, don't think you're going to come live in my house and make me feel bad. You're going to pull your weight now. This ain't just some party time, you hear? So that's telling her she got to work in order to stay there. You already abandoned me, bitch. You ain't raised me. And now you telling me I got to work just to be in your house. So understand the, the emotional abuse there. Like you abandoned me. And now that I'm here, you telling me that the only way I can stay here is if I, is this, if I work. Even though at this time, anime was still like a teenager. I understand the time frame that we're in. You know, there's no man around. So we need you to work so we can have another paycheck coming into the household so we're not struggling. Understandably so. But it should not be, you know, you can't stay here if you're not working. Because you already wasn't there for the first half of this child's life when you left her. And then nobody was there for the grandmother's funeral. So she had to deal with the death of her grandmother by herself. Y'all, that's a lot. You're not late, late. We still at the beginning, okay? She not late. You know, you're not late, late. But yeah, that, I was like, no, yes, no accountability whatsoever. So I think the mom's guilt and her resentment towards anime just grew over time. The more successful anime got, the more, resent, the, the more resentful her mom got, which is why her mom will often sell her out to, to Ike throughout the years. And we'll talk about that as we go through it. But just off rip, y'all, it's all bad. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the childhood, the, the abandonment, the, the way her mom treats her. You know what I'm saying? Like it, none of it's good. <laughs> okay. And, and we're barely 16. Okay. So. She tells her tomorrow she needs to find a job. Then she tells Aileen to take Anna with her to work because Aileen is a bartender down at the club at night. And she wants her to take teenage Anna Mae with her because she needs some privacy. She got a date. So the girl has barely been there a few hours and you already kicking her out the house so you can get some dick. Some people shouldn't have children is what it feels like. It feels like Anna Mae's mama shouldn't have had kids is what it feel like. Okay. So Anna is taken to the club that Aileen bartends for. There are grown men in this bar. The grown men like Ike Turner and the Kings of Rhythm are eyeing a young Anna Mae. Okay. Then Ike comes on stage and sings Rocket 88. You heard me? Oh, we say you heard it long. Oh, I hate when I mess it up. Heard the noise they make. Let me introduce my Rocket 88. Yes, it is great. Just one way. Another on my Rocket 88. Nigga, don't be saying words. My Rocket 88. Riding in style. Moving and cruising along. Got to be in moment. Mom, this I. A little top little girl stole mine. Rolling with me. Having all bound down to joy. Play that thing. Okay, it's my shit. Okay. That, that's not the part though. Okay, that's not the part. You gotta calm down. You gotta calm down. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
Because y'all know I'm going to do it, okay? Y'all know I'm going to do it because that's not the song. But either way, he come out on stage, he sing Rocket 88, and all of the girls are smitten. Anna is smitten and all of the other girls are, okay? And then he starts to sing, I know you love me, baby, but you never tell me so. Okay, and all of the girls are terrible. They can't sing worth a damn. Aileen tells Anna, Ike has a reputation, okay? He's a mess, okay? He a hoe. That's what she said, okay? And then he, the girl get on the stage. What's so in particular, baby? Oh, it stays on my mind. Ah, she's screaming in the mic. Yes, what in particular song, baby? Always stays on my mind. Ah! <laughs> Every time to play, baby. <laughs> she screamed through the whole damn song, but she knew she was singing. I said, who let the church girl out? Okay, who let the church girl out? So Anna goes home and starts practicing in the mirror. Okay, Aileen and her mama making fun of her. This is another thing I noticed. Making fun of the girl for singing, but everybody's going to reap the benefits off of her in the bathroom, you know, singing into the mirror. Okay. Anyway, so Anna showed up. Dressed like a grown ass woman, ready to sing the next time they went down to the club in the white dress. Oh, Anna, I told you not to bar the white dress. Oh, my. Is anyone sitting here? <laughs> okay. And that's when um one of the band members tell her to stick around after the last set so he could take her out for breakfast. And he look over at Aileen and, you know, she was like, you know, all right. All right. You know. So, but she ready to sing, okay? It ain't even about him. We here to sing, okay? So, a Aileen tells her she hopes she knows what comes along with that tag tour, meaning that somebody going to be expecting some coochie, okay? So, some white woman, the only white woman in the club with a white man going, you know, take her clothes off on the mic, looking a mess, okay? Somebody snatched the mic from her. And they bring it to Anna, and she hit the mic all. Hold on, hold on. <clears throat> I know you love me, baby, but you never tell me so. I know you love me, baby, there you go. but you never tell me so. Mm. If you don't tell me you love me, I'm going to pack my rags and go. Hey, they was feeling it. Oh, I live across the street from a jukebox, baby. Oh, not long that they play the blues. Okay, Aileen, surprise. I live across the street from a jukebox, baby. Oh, not long that they play the blues. And every time they play, baby, I Stop right in the cry. Oh, please don't leave me, baby. Okay, everybody goes crazy. Okay. Oh, that girl know how to sing. Oh, go on, give it to her. <laughs> okay. Go on, give it to her. Y'all, this is the first time that Lawrence Fishburne, aka Ike, bites his lip. My daddy used to do this exact same thing. <laughs> there are parallels in this movie to my childhood. And I'm going to remind y'all, I watched this movie over and over and over and over and over again. And what I have learned in therapy is when you repeat something over and over and over again in your mind, it means it's something that you are trying to learn from it. It has some, it, some significance that you keep wanting to see it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. So keep with me. Okay. They say, y'all say YouTube keep crashing. Well, it's good on my end. So if y'all are having issues on y'all end, remember I'm also on Facebook. Okay. Y'all can also find me on Facebook and I'm also on my website. So go to those places as well. If you having issues with YouTube. Okay. Cause I am live on Facebook. OK, um, so y'all can go over on Facebook, Bondi Blue on Facebook, all the bonbons on Facebook, but it's good on my end. So the replay will still be good. OK, 
Um, it was skipping, but I had to let it keep running in order to run. Okay, so it, it's not me. It was earlier. Okay. I just switched to watching you on my TV. Hopefully it still works. Okay, mine dropped once we came back. So, okay, it's not on my end because I don't see my, my stuff going down. Uh, but let's continue on. All right. So Anna blew everybody out the park. Okay. Hold on. Let me go. Let me go. Okay. After they go to a mixed diner and Spider, the piano player who was supposed to be taking her out, is shooed away by Ike. I was like, nigga. <laughs> I go so well. Okay. And when they sit down, she says, Well, where's Spider go? And he says, Oh, I just sent him to give me some cigarettes. He had a whole pack full of cigarettes that he plopped on the table. So red flag number one is that the is lying. Okay, then is a liar. This was the first red flag. But if you notice, Anna Mae is talking in this very high voice because right now we're young and innocent and have no idea how terrible these niggas actually are. Now they condense this, but in real life, Anna Mae was with one of the guitar players. I forgot the man's name, but she got pregnant for him. She was in a real relationship with him. Her relationship with Ike was always one of a brother-sister relationship. They weren't ever really like romantically involved until after the music took off. Okay. Which should let you know that line, all them, you know, are oh, you going to try to leave me like all them other suckers I done made famous? That line right there is very, very important to why he decided to be with Anna and turned it into the Ike and Tina Turner situation. This is, I, I think this is one of the first times somebody realized that them being in a relationship made their music career be better. Like I know y'all see nowadays, everybody links up so that they can get more clout for whatever they have going on musically. You know what I'm saying? Like for instance, when I think Meg Thee Stallion first came into the music industry, she was linked to one of the other rappers or something like that. I can't remember which one it was, but she was linked to one of the rappers they were supposed to be dating, but that really wasn't happening. You know, it was something that was obviously put together by the record label. Well, this situation, I feel like Raymond Hill. Yeah, uh, the book is re is required reading, y'all. It is because I I remember um I read certain things from an article back in the day. I used to love reading stuff about her money bag. Okay, so y'all know like now we realize that relationships make the money better. It makes people pay attention to the music that's being had because it's like, oh, these two people are making music together and they're in a relationship. We're all of a sudden riveted by this shit and we have to see it, okay? So I think he realized that it would be the way to keep her from leaving him. All the other people could leave. But if you're married to somebody, if you're in a relationship with somebody, they can't leave you. OK, especially if you're a man and you're abusive and this woman, you know, is, you know, relying on you for everything. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, Sonny and Cher. There were a lot of couples, um, you know, the Donnie, Donnie and Marie and, you know, a child. I don't know if they was brother and sister child, but y'all know a whole bunch of other ones that were like couples and it proved to be good for business. But it doesn't mean that it's actually a good thing. You know what I'm saying? Fuck Desi Arnaz and, and you know, um. Lucille Ball, you know, everybody was fascinated by their relationship eventually, but it wasn't good for them. And they had to break up eventually. Um, So, it, you know, a lot of relationships, Donnie and Marie were, that's what I said. I, you know, I think they were siblings, but y'all know what I mean. There was somebody else, child. <laughs> Leave me alone. Okay. Y'all know, I don't know these clear people all the time. Okay. Thank you. Ashford and Simpson. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. You know, that's what I was really thinking about and couldn't like, you know, two names that they always have together. But I love me some Ashford and Simpson. Don't make me start singing that as a rock. Y'all remember when it used to be on the Burger King commercial? Don't get me started. Back in the day. Okay. So I'm sorry, you guys. We're sitting at the diner. She's never been in an integrated um, restaurant before. That was another thing. They didn't say it, but she was so, peaches and herb, that's another one. She was so shocked to see this white lady come and wait on her at this diner. Because where she was from in, you know, Nutbush, Tennessee, it was still very segregated. You know what I'm saying? Donnie Hathaway and Roberta Flack. Marvin and Tammy. Yes, y'all know. Y'all know how they play on our emotions with these ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Couplings. Okay, get out of here. Um, <clears throat> but Ike tells her he likes the way she sings. She has a unique sound. She got a flair. Oh, you got a flair. You definitely got a flair. And she asked, do you have it? 
a flair? And he was like, yeah, well, I do have a flair. I have a flair for songwriting, and I also have a, fly, uh, a flair for picking good artists and making singers famous, you know? And then he tells her about how a lot of them, once they get on, they go ahead and they leave him. But, you know, that's all fitting to change, okay? And we wonder why that's all fitting to change, because you're planning to make your next person somebody that you can force into a relationship with you, seemingly, Okay. But anyway, I think he saw that it was fitting to change because he had set his sights on her. <clears throat> and he says he found him a new artist. And she was like, is he any good? And he was like, she, she is very good. Matter of fact, she is very good. Okay. And, um, you know, she goes home and she tells her mom and Aileen and Aileen calls and anime, get your gullible country ass out the clouds. That's what he says to all the girls. That's his line. And nobody's taking her seriously. <laughs> okay, I'm still laughing in my mind about Jennifer Lewis. Did you take a pearl out of these pearls, girl? They tied around my neck. Maybe it's all them chitlins you ate. Don't start with me, Miss Helene. What? <laughs> and then here come Ike knocking on the door, y'all. Just as they were telling Anime to get her country gullible ass out the clouds, here come Ike in the Kings of Rhythm knocking on the door. Ike wants her to sing with him, but her mama says, this little girl's going to be a nurse and bring a steady paycheck in this house, okay? And Ike asked if she ever saw a nurse driving an automobile as fine as his. He says she will be making big money in no time. Her mom asks if she's really that good. And he says, listen, I can have anybody I want, but I want her. Let her come down to rehearsal. Let me work with her. And I'll show you. He says, also, I saw that some of my boys crushed some of your flowers accidentally outside. This should cover the damages. And he hands over a hundred dollar bill. And it was basically like he bought Anna. That's what it feels like. It feels like he bought her. The mama was not willing to let her go until she was paid. And so then she saw it as, okay, this is going to make me some money. It was never really about protecting Anna. And that's what's bothersome for me. You know what I'm saying? That it was never about protecting her daughter from a man who could see her as, you know, easy pickings because she was from the country and young and gullible and naive. It only took you $100 and you sent your daughter into the lion's den with this nigga. Like, if y'all know the mama ain't shit, know the mama ain't shit, okay? <laughs> She's not, Okay. Moving on from there, Anna starts rehearsing with the band, okay? I'm talking to the priest, the high priest, and everybody out there in the universe. If what I'm saying is wrong, then tell me what to say, because I want to be made over. Tell them to sing from, sing from up and through here. Y'all know this, okay? Why you got to sing it like a man? Why you sing it like a man? <laughs> Look, that's what sell records, Miss Bullock. You want to drink? Yeah, I want to drink, but I want to keep my eye. Look, make me green, clean me and limit it, wash me clean, make me over, make me nice, and when I'm done, oh, I want to be right, hello, make me over, hello, make me over, I want to be made over, I want to be made over, I want to go crazy. Oh, I want to do some things. I want to be a star. Oh, I want to have a big name. And in my heart, let beauty reign. And when I'm done, oh, I want to have fame. Listen. Ooh, listen. We're not. We're, listen. I love it. Make me over. Make me nice. I love it. Okay. That mama didn't care. Talking about keep singing sing rough. Sing rough. <laughs> It means from down in the diaphragm, the diaphragm. Okay, listen, the diaphragm. Ooh, okay, listen, background singers, where y'all at? <laughs> okay, so Anna joins the review and Ike's baby mama Lorraine is tired of this shit, Ike. Oh, wait, 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 nah, come on, nah. The Ike has let Anna know that Ike is always booking her head. Okay, so she needs to watch herself. I ain't got a thing for every young heifer that sticks her butt out. Anna tells her, you wish he did. Girl, he do. <laughs> 
One night before Anna goes home, Ike is flirting with her, telling her how pretty her smile is. And then he tells her to open her mouth. And for some reason, she thought him telling her to open her mouth that they were going to kiss. But he tells her that he going to have Frost carry her down there to the dentist. I said, mind games. <laughs> that was a mind game. I'm going to tell you, you pretty, get you open, and then I'm going to disappoint you. So in some way now, I'm kind of playing with your emotions. It's a mind game. It's a mind game, like master manipulator already, as far as I'm concerned, okay? And later on, we'll find out that Ike Turner was bipolar, but right now, you're manipulative as fuck, okay? Um, then he tells her it's too late for her to go home so she can stay in the back room. And this should let y'all know that the relationship initially was not sexual, okay? So while she was sleeping, Lorraine comes into the room with a gun asking, what the fuck is going on here? And it's like, please, Lorraine, please don't. Like, don't shoot me, bitch. I'm not fucking him yet. <laughs> and Lorraine says, you not even worth the bullet. And she walks out and goes into the other room and shoots herself in the head. But she doesn't shoot herself in the head in a way that actually harms her. So she lives beyond this. But she did it in front of her kid. Ike Jr. runs into the room. So everybody now has to remember that their youngest kid, kid probably has some recollection of his mom shooting herself in the damn head. You know what I'm saying? So Ike Jr. was fucked up off rip. Okay. Thank you so much for the super chat, Sila. He, I haven't seen you in a minute. Thank you, love. Love this movie. Love Tina Turner. Thank you for reviewing it. My perspective had changed as I watched it several times over the years. Also like the video, y'all. Yes, like it. Okay, like it. Why did uh, Ike Jr. pass away? Oh, R.I.P. Ike Jr. Damn, I didn't know Ike Jr. passed away too. I know that um her oldest... Um, Tina's oldest committed suicide at some point, Craig. <clears throat> and Craig was supposed to be her first child with him, but I told y'all, no, that was a child with one of the other musicians in the band. Okay. But either way, Lorraine was still alive to live another day. Okay. But her and Ike are probably really over at, at this point. Cause when he comes back home from the hospital, he says, Lorraine will pull through just fine and ask if he's okay. And she's comforting him. And this scene right here reminded me of my parents. Okay, not the sex part, but more so the he tells her how his father took uh, three long years to die after a man kicked a hole in his stomach because he was messing around with some gangster's woman. Okay, so you have a lot of childhood trauma there. Okay, and what does he do? He cries and he brings up his childhood trauma. And this is somebody that's been abandoned. And he tells her that everybody in his life is all, all left him. And she know what that feels like because she has her own abandonment issues. And she promises him that she'll never do him like that. She'll never leave him like that. They had a friendship. People said, if you look it up, they'll tell you the relationship was like brother and sister. So, you know, on some level, she probably really meant that shit when she said it to him. Like, no, I'm going to be here because you my boy. I got you. Women often, often do this, right? They want to be there for a man, to show a man that, you know, everybody isn't the same, that, you know, somebody can care for them. Not realizing that they're trauma bonding with somebody that's going to use that against them later on. I think it was all very purposeful. You know what I'm saying? He kisses Anna and she says, no, she got to go. And for me, that made me feel like this is one of those times when a woman was just trying to be an emotional comfort and a man decides to cross a boundary with her after he has trauma bonded and opened opened her up to him emotionally now you're going to take advantage of her sexually she probably wasn't really trying to have sex with him but it was the trauma bonding part that reminded me of my people like i really do feel like my parents trauma bonded over being the youngest child that never felt appreciated that never felt that their good deeds were actually seen I think they trauma bonded over that. Um, and I think that them two trauma bonded over being abandoned. So recipe for issues, <laughs> recipe for trauma, further trauma, trauma bonding with crazy motherfuckers. Okay. So they ended up having sex. Okay. Lorraine uh, was not his wife. So he had to let her know that because she was, you know, she was apprehensive, but he was like, come on, Anna, you the only one that he feels, you know, he put that shit on it. He told her she was the only one and all of that, put the sugar on and now they have sex. 
Then they go on tour. Okay, so everything's happening very quickly. They go on tour. They go to the salon to get Anna's hair done. They wanted her to bleach her hair blonde back in the day. They didn't know what they was doing. That was not a good idea. But they wanted this black lady to look like Marilyn Monroe. Okay, don't make no goddamn sense. But okay, so Anna and all the singers go to get their hair done. They talk about how Ike works the fuck out of everybody. And you know what they say about Ike. You know, and they also talk about how Anna's appetite has picked up. So now we're kind of linking into the fact that Anna's pregnant. They're really like, you know, mixing the timeline. But just understand that in real life, Anna had Craig and all of that and was not in a relationship with Ike at all. But they were working together musically. She was pregnant for somebody in the band. OK, but either way. We just doing the movie, but I just want to reference that. So then Anna's hair falls out. Now, you know you need an ass whooping. <laughs> so now we're going to wear wigs. Okay, this was really like one of those moments that's a catch-22. It's a terrible moment because all of your hair fell out. But then this is when you figured out that y'all need to just wear wigs for the way that y'all perform anyway. Okay? And they get their wigs and they go out there for the first show. Okay? Rock me, baby. Rock me all night long. Come on, back up. Uh, said I want you to rock me, baby. Rock me all night long. I want you to rock me like my back ain't got no bones. Then I want you to woo, roll me, daddy, like you roll your flower down. Ooh, mm, mm. Ooh I want you to. Roll me, daddy, like you roll your flower dough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want you to roll me till I want no more. Oh, play the song. Okay, listen, I know the damn ad libs. Okay, they get backstage. Ooh, and girl, you was lit. Okay, you were those people way down. You were wonderful. Everybody's happy. Then Ike comes in. Okay, whose idea was this? Snatching wigs off. Okay, whose idea was this? this look, we got going on here. I like it. He was scared. Everybody was scared, y'all. He came in there asking about the wigs and everybody got scared. And then he was like, no, I like it. This is perfect. We're going to keep this in the act from now on. Okay, they got, what do you say, 39 dates between here and a good night's sleep. So y'all know what y'all got to do. <laughs> working these people to fucking death okay and this is when uh hold up hold up hold up uh he clocks her weight and tells her he likes it you know she looked healthy like that <laughs> then anna has craig like i said who wasn't ice child but raymond hills one of the bandmates the one of the bandmates' babies since she was dating him before Ike. But in the movie, it's his baby and it's Ike and Tina Turner. The doctor says that Tina was very ill, a severe case of anemia, and he wasn't discharging her for another three weeks. Well, Ike said we got a lot of dates between here, here and there. We got San Antonio. We got St. Augustine. No, we got a lot of money going on right now. And so Ike and Frost sneak anime out of the hospital her and the baby enough to kill a damn lady okay and then he tells her he got a ring and they're gonna go down to mexico and get married in a few hours and then they off to new york city and in real life it wasn't even this romantic it wasn't even this romantic i don't even think he ever got a ring or anything like that it wasn't ever a proposal or nothing we just gonna get married yeah i think he called on the phone and told her in real life okay so there wasn't ever any like romantic part to any of this shit. Okay. So Aileen and her mama can look after the baby while they gone. Okay. And when they go to Mexico, it's another thing he did to her. I didn't like, she's saying goodbye to everybody. He get in the car and have the car driver pull off. So she running behind the car and he keep doing it. to her. So when she get back in the car, she mad, you know, and she hitting him. And then he was like, Hey, stop. Hey, y'all. My daddy used to do this exact same thing, y'all. My daddy used to have, hey, 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 be cool by the pool, fool. Hey, that, that's your warning. Because when, when the lip get bit, 
and that little hair come up here, okay? When this hair down here come up here, you about to get beat. That's usually how this happened. <laughs> like, you about to get beat, y'all. I don't know. It was a reflection in my own life, okay? Listen to me. It, okay. If it's glitching on YouTube, go to Facebook, y'all. If it's glitching on YouTube, go to Facebook, okay? Oh, thank you. Y'all know people tell me they don't like my singing, so I don't be knowing. But um, that's why I got these earphones on so I can hear myself, okay? But he had her chasing a car. This is all red flags, y'all. All red flags. So then they go to New York for a show. And Anna is still sick with the brand new baby. Ike comes in mad because he isn't getting any ink in the paper for this show, meaning they're not publicizing it like they're supposed to. When he asks Anna why she isn't dressed yet, she says she's tired and her throat is tired. What if she go out there and don't nothing come out? He tells her that he got way too much riding on tonight. And she was like, listen, this has all happened too fast. The baby, the road, you know, the music. I just think I need a break. I need some rest. And he says, listen, we need to get paid because if we don't get paid, we don't eat. And she was like, well, what about me? He said, well, what about the band? You talking about the baby in the road and all this and having too fast. You got more excuses than nigga going to jail. You got too many excuses, woman. That monkey out there say, I can Tina Turner. People out there waiting on me and you laying up here talking about you tired. Oh, what you tired? You trying to leave me? You trying to leave me like all the motherfuckers I made famous? She says, no, that's not what I'm saying. He said, then what you talking about, Ann? We at the right place at the right time that I've been trying to get my whole life. Now, I need you to get out on that stage right now. And she says, I'm sorry. And he says, you sorry, all right? You the sorriest motherfucker I've never seen. It's supposed to be the biggest night in my career. You done fucked that up for me. Yeah, you a sorry motherfucker, all right? Y'all, you have worked this lady to death. She had a baby. She's sick. You took her out the hospital. You brought her to fucking Mexico. You married her. Okay. And as if we're going in the storyline, we're going to read the book and come back later. But this is we just read, you know, straight off the movie. You put this lady through all of this shit. And now that her body is telling her I'm tired, you decide to verbally abuse her, put all of the weight of your career on her shoulders. And then tell her she's a sorry motherfucker for being too tired right now after having a baby. Can we say that he been ain't shit? Can we say he been ain't shit? Oh, my God. So y'all know they go out there and they sing fool in love. He didn't talk to her bad. She got dressed. She still looks sick. But she go out there on stage. Oh, somebody please, please tell me what's wrong. Because y'all know you had to come and kiss her on the cheek. You just a fool. You know you in love. What you say? Hey, 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 yeah. Tell me one more time. Tell me about it. Why he treats you like he do and he's such a good man. Listen. Listen. Y'all. Y'all. She performed her ass off on stage. And I also want to say this about this specific like song. I feel like they don't even show you the amount of stage work that went into their performances. After I finish this review, I will implore everybody to do, the, do yourself a favor and go look up some of Ike and Tina Turner's performances so you can see how crazy the energy was on stage when she performed. I feel like the movie got it, but not really. Like, they didn't show you how many performances, how, like, it was really some shit you've only seen replicated in Beyonce's stage show. I can tell y'all that right now. But if you go watch that shit, I promise y'all, you're not gonna, like, see many other performances like theirs. So musically, the arranging that I did on some of those songs, amazing. Redid those white boy songs better than they had their own, better than they did their own songs, y'all. That um, 
uh, uh, um, come together right now over me. That right there, that is um the Beatles, John Lennon and them, right? Tina, I can Tina Turner's rearranging of that song is to me better than the original version. The way they perform it, then I feel like I can Tina, well, Tina specifically with the choreography. I don't know who was all doing choreography for the dancers, but they were like implementing like karate and, and all kind of like jujitsu type of moves. I don't know what the fuck to call it because that's not my expertise. People who know, they know. But if you've seen like those movements, you will see it replicated in some of the dance moves that they did, which made me feel like there was a lot of researching and looking at other people's art you know, art forms and, and compiling it in a way that made sense for them. The stage show was impeccable. Ike was a perfectionist and I feel like the movie did not fully cover that the way it should have. Because when you really go and listen to some of those songs that they redid, they did a lot of, um, you know, redoing other people's songs, covers. They did a lot of covers and they really did redo the shit out of a lot of people's songs y'all like you gotta go hear it for yourself you gotta see the stage show for yourself to like really get why tina i can tina was so big but then not really like the drugs and the bad business all of that shit is what really fucks them up but the talent was definitely there with both of them okay Oh, yeah. I think it's going to work out fine. It's going to work out fine. Let me tell you something, Ike. And Ike, I've been to see the preacher man. The preacher man, why you must be losing your mind. <laughs> I started, started making wedding plans. Oh, yeah. If your love is as half as true as the love I offer you, oh darling, I think it's gonna work out fine. Listen, I love it. Okay, so yes, they did Fool in Love, okay, which y'all know the lyrics are perfect for that. Got me loving when my heart is in pain. Oh boy, now I must be a fool. Cause I do anything he wants me to Now how come don't you love me You can't understand Why he treats you like he do And he's such a good man Come on, tell me Do, 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 do Tell me one more time hey, oh, hey, hey. Do, do, tell me one more time Oh, I know Okay, I'm not hitting that high note I don't have it <laughs> Yeah, I don't have it. I don't have it. Yeah, I don't have it. I have to be louder. And I don't have it. I'm not close. You know, I'm too close to the mic. I don't want to be that loud, you know, because I'll be having to like really like push my high notes out, girl. I don't want to do it. Okay. Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, I need to make it to the rest of this video. Um, but yes, I know Lyrica's mama was an Ike. It. I know she was. And she also used to do performances with Ike before he passed away. Um, but yes, y'all. Um Ike gets an advance on Fooling in Love and other songs he plans to write. So the family and the band are moving into a new house. Jackie points out that she hasn't seen a dime of the money yet. Okay, because they're moving them out of the old house into a new one. And they're talking about, you know, oh my, oh my, I'm a fool in love. <laughs> Child, we used to get paid before we work. Now, we, well, she said we used to work before we get paid. Now we get paid before we even work. Okay, Anime Bullock, you priceless, woman, you priceless. And then Jackie says, shit, she priceless, all right. She ain't seen a dime of it yet. So Jackie is already pointing out that Tina being in a relationship with Ike, Anna being in a relationship with Ike means that she's not getting her just due because she's his wife. Because they get paid. And then he controls the money. So then her mama reminds her not to forget those who helped her to get where she is. Oh, no, mama, never forget my blood. 
pulling on the purse strings already. They ain't even cashed the check yet. Then when she turns around, she sees Darlene, one of the other Ikeettes, flirting with Ike, played by Candy Alexander. Girl, I do love me some Candy Alexander. That's a old, that's a old, um, a old, um, talented ass old bitch. Okay, <laughs> I love me some Ca Candy Alexander, girl. Okay, but she plays Darlene, and he flirting with Darlene, and Darlene flirting with him. And she tells her mama, every time I turn my back, mama. And her mama says, oh, he's a good man. Don't be nagging him now. Look, you got yourself a good man. You just make sure you keep him happy. Bad advice. Terrible advice. He disrespecting her in her face. And you going to tell her that she needs to stop nagging him? You know why, right? Because the mama probably felt like I used to get my ass beat by a poor man. At least you getting your ass beat by a man that can make you some money. Fucked up. But that's what that's what the mama is thinking about. You can't tell me no different. Okay. Then here come Lorraine. Lorraine said, oh, you want to be family man, huh? You want to play daddy and shit? Okay, here come your two oldest sons, okay? Oh, I hear y'all go. Say hello to your daddy. Uh oh, hey, 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 hey. Where you? Hey, Lorraine, Lorraine, you come right here with this bullshit. I, I done told you I come around here with this mess, okay? What am I do with two more kids? What am I do with more kids? She said, leave me alone, I He's like, you always gonna come around here and start this mess. What am I do with two more kids, huh? And it was just like, I don't know, nigga, figure it out. You just got a, a, a big old check and you got a brand new wife and a new baby and you have two other babies. But it seemed like you got the money and the people around to help you figure it the fuck out. What kind of shit is that? What I'm gonna do with two more kids? So off rip, you got two kids that didn't feel like they were really wanted. Off rip. So now you didn't gave abandonment issues to all of the fucking kids okay so don't 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 have any high hopes for the kids okay because y'all didn't fuck the kids up already okay so they moved to los angeles okay there you are just a walking next to me and singing no oh, i did it did it dumb did it do first of all lawrence fishburne talked about it and i said this in one of my recent videos that he did an interview with the jasmine brand talking about how he actually was abusive in his first marriage and he had to go to therapy for like five years in order to get himself in a better space and i was just like i really wish that he would have said that shit in an interview back in the day <laughs> like i wish somebody would have said that shit back in the day because when i tell you i feel like my part needed therapy like my part needed therapy for real. And, you know, it was the 90s, the 80s and the 90s. Like, when nobody going to get this angry ass nigga no therapy? He was going to drink and go to work and do the best he could. But his ass needed some fucking therapy. Okay? But anyway, they moved to Los Angeles. Another kid. So Tina gets pregnant for Ike's first child with her. Okay? And they're making more money now. The British invasion is happening. They get interviewed and Tina says, you know, ain't nothing new about the British invasion. It ain't nothing but black or Negro music. And um, the, the reporter asked Tina about Ike not feeling appreciated. The fuck? And he just kind of sitting there. And Tina says, well, Ike has been writing a lot of great new songs. So you can tell that even in interviews, she's constantly having to, to like coax his ego. Because he's insecure about his gift. Because it's not popping off the way he wants it to pop off. But they are giving him opportunities. But he's squandering those opportunities. Because he's bipolar. He's on drugs. And he's abusing drugs. So he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah, they have their hits. You know? But eventually there's a montage, right? And in the montage, you see him in the studio. You see him doing the drugs in the studio. You see him crashing and her dragging him out. So understand that that's probably something that happened over and over and over again over the years. Where her having to get him, you know, get your ass up and do what you got to do with the songs and all of that. Pulling him out of the studio with cocaine all over his face. But anyway, the pool party. So. This is where things start to mirror my life and I start to talk about personal shit. So let's do it. Okay. The pool party. They're having a pool party. 
Ike is in the studio doing cocaine, screaming about you motherfuckers, it's too loud out there. I'm trying to work, God damn it. So she comes in, come on, Ike, come on, take a break. She said, I ain't got no time to take a break. I got to work now. I got to, you know, make these songs, okay? Sue Rock has been after me about these songs for six months. And, you know, and I would have them right now. If you would just sing the song the way I want, you know, need you to sing it, man, to make God damn, okay? And she says to him, she was like, damn, Ike, you know, I'm trying, you know, uh, Tina doesn't understand because she doesn't spend any of the money. He tells her that he's paying a band, paying for wardrobe, paying for their home to be furnished the way it is. All that shit, you know, this fountain, this sofa and shit, that shit costs money anime. And on top of that, I got to pay the boys and I got to tell you, I got to uh, pay the band and I'm trying to build us a studio. And she was like, and you want the studio. And he says, and I would have it by now if you would sing the songs the way I tell you to sing them, anime, goddamn. That's not even something you should be able to do to somebody. I'm a fucking artist. So how I get the song out is how I get the song out. That's why you like me, right? That's how he all started off liking her because of how she sang. And now you're telling her to sing how he want her to sing. And she says, you know, I be trying, but they all sound the same. She tired of singing the same music, but she had no real input, right? So she says this to him. He said, what you say? The kids are there. The girls are outside. And he backhand slaps her. And then she falls over the sofa. And she says, you promised you wouldn't hit me. Please don't hit me. And he punches her several times. And he drags her down the hallway past the kids' bedroom into the, to their bedroom, throws her against the bed, and then says, so I guess now you're going to leave me now, huh? So you get to beat her, and then you get to guilt her. So then here's mine, okay? So I have a memory that I tie to this movie to where I don't know whether it was a memory or it was, uh, you know, something from the movie. And then recently I had a conversation with my sister about a time when my dad punched my mom and knocked her out while she was holding me. And I remember it. I was only two. As soon as she said it, I remembered it. When I would watch this movie, he dragged her down the hallway. The positioning of the kids' room is exactly where my bedroom was in juxtaposition to my parents' room. So even the way the hallway into the bedroom, the child, the kids' room, all look the same. I watched this movie over and over and over again as a kid. And I watched it over and over again as a kid because it resolved in the movie. And in my life, it may have gotten better than it was then, but it wasn't resolving because the anger was still there. My dad got less abusive, but he was still very angry. And so it turns into discipline towards me. So that's why this was hard for me to review. Because at the same time as I was getting myself ready to do this and preparing for this, I'm having these conversations with my sister about our lives and why we didn't get along. And why one of my first memories is calling the police because they were screaming at each other so loud and I couldn't take it anymore. And my grandmother and my aunt used to always tell me, call 911. They put that in my head. At a very early age, if something happens, call 911. Call 911. And that was one of the times where I got so scared, I called 911. I was five. So understand that these types of things were happening a lot when I was very young. I think when I called the police that one time, that was enough to where it was like, we can't keep doing this because now she's getting old enough to actually do stuff, say stuff to people about what's happening. So as time went on, he kind of pulled it together and became less like that. Um, but the anger, again, the anger, the controlling, and then every now and again, the violence would be towards me. And, you know, it would look like discipline. 
But it was the same type of abuse that, you know, my mom was dealing with. It just it, it was easier to do it to me because I was the kid. So if I do something that you perceive as disrespectful as wrong, you can now be abusive towards me and call it discipline. And then you have to reconcile that type of shit with being told that nobody loves you more than me. So the the it, it has been um a challenge for me to not respond in my relationships to what I was being raised in. So in one breath, I have to walk on eggshells with one parent so that they don't do these things. I have to be perfect so they don't do these things. And then with the other parent, I am now protective of you. I now protect you. And then when it's time for you to protect me, you betray me. I have forgotten about it. I have forgotten about it what the betrayal felt like because it would happen a lot. It would happen over and over and over again. When people are in abusive relationships, they go through cycles of being good with each other, being on the outs with each other, and being in total discourse with each other. When they were good, I was either a part of it or I was sent away so they could be good. When they weren't good, I was an emotional support blanket. And when they really weren't good, I was protective on top of being an emotional support blanket. And then when they get back in a good place, I have to be reminded of all the good things about my dad. So that I can stop being angry because I'm angry. I'm so angry, but I'm not allowed to be angry because being angry when you're a kid is disrespect. But how else do you respond when all you're taught is either how to, you know, beg for somebody to see you basically you're, sil you're silenced a lot, you know, because you, you can't say, you can't, you can't act angry, you can't be angry, you can't show emotion, you can't do any of that. You have to remain perfect. And then you can't show anybody what's going on. You can't talk to anybody about what's going on because you have to protect everybody's image. You have to protect everybody. Nobody's protecting you, but you have to protect everybody. This is how I was raised. I was raised to protect everybody and not protect myself. And at some point I learned how to just lie down and take it. Just lie down and take it because nobody's going to stand up for you. And when you try to stand up for yourself, they're going to beat you for it. So just take it. I learned that growing up. And then Katrina and stuff happens and you kind of forget because new trauma replaces the old trauma. So now when I watch this back and I remember how I wanted to sing and dance and I would be in my mom's hair salon wrecking havoc, saying whatever I wanted to say, dancing and singing and performing this movie down to a T to the point where my aunt got me a wig and a dress that looked exactly like her dress. The one that shimmies, the blue one. She made me one just like that because I needed to get it out. And what I was seeing <laughs> 
was that the way to get it out was to perform, was to sing, was to make people feel good when they were watching you. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's what I did. You know what I'm saying? That's how I channeled it. And from a very young age, I was being shown how to channel what I was going through. Because this came out, what, 1992, 1993? At the time, I was one, two, four, five. So this is around the time where I'm starting to recognize what's happening around me. You know what I'm saying? So now I start watching this movie over and over and over and over again in my life. Watching it with my parents, 93, thank you. Watching it with my parents over and over and over and over again and wondering how they can have this cognitive dissonance to watch this movie and not see themselves. Because people always want to say it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But it's bad. <laughs> that was me as the oldest of five kids. Thank you for the super chat, Silly. He, I was the youngest and I was the one left to deal with it because everybody else had gone. So it was just me. Uh, Mary Spark was like, well, thank you for the super chat. I remember my mom was putting pause on her boyfriend because he cheated on her and stole money from her. He begged me to call the cops. My mom told me to take my ass to bed. I was so scared, but I went back to bed. Like, that's fucked up to even put a kid in that situation. Okay. Um, but yeah, so like that was why it was so hard for me to actually like review this. Because before I wasn't emotionally in a place where I was going to be able to make it through this portion without crying. And I wanted to be able to get it off and, and say what it is. Um, you know what I'm saying? And, and just get it out there without breaking down. Um, you have to go to the homepage where it says join or down below in the description box. My Patreon account is there and my website is there as well. You can become members that way as well. Thank you. Oh, no, that's Mo. Thank you for the super chat. Bondi is crazy because I'm going to therapy for the exact same thing. I catch myself from being expressive in relationships because I was afraid of how they would feel. It's just me, only child. I get it. Thank you for that. And I totally get it. And that's basically, you know, I wasn't the only child but because I was the youngest by so many years. I was in the house with them by myself. And me and my sister just had this conversation. She was able to leave. She was able to go and stay by her dad. She was able to go and stay with my aunts when she wanted to because she had more freedom because she wasn't my dad's kid. But I was my dad's kid. So I had a different set of rules and I couldn't go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? I just had to be there and deal with it. I can remember like wishing that they would get a divorce at some point. When he got sick, I was glad that none of that happened and that it all happened the way it did because I didn't have him for much longer. And, you know, in the way that he could, I honestly, I feel like since my dad has died, he's been able to let all of that go. Um, the energy I feel from him when I dream of him is the version of him that I love. And I loved all the versions of him, unfortunately. That's how I was raised, um, to love people regardless to how they treat me. Thank you, Queen RN, for becoming a member. I appreciate it. Um, but the thing about me and my dad was because the situation was the way it was, um, we had a very, um, we could communicate without talking. Me and my dad, we can communicate without talking at some point. So when he got sick and, you know, eventually died, he was communicating with me all throughout that. When he died before, like I just I had a we had an understanding um, for lack of a better term, because when my mom said we had an understanding, that shit sent me into turmoil. <laughs> but it really was like by the time my dad died, I had come to terms with who he was. I have told y'all before my dad. Um, there was a moment where uh, right before he passed away um, within like that year or two where I heard him having a conversation with his mom, where I heard him talking to her and he was just pleading with her to stay at our house instead of going back to New Orleans to be there with my aunt, who is, who is a paranoid schizophrenic. My dad is like, I have this comfortable home for you. I've done all of this to make you comfortable. Why are you still trying to leave? The way it sounded when I heard him talk to her, it was all the pain that I had never, like my dad was this big man. But when I heard him talk to her like that, something clicked in, in me. 
And I was then able to give him the sympathy that I don't think he ever gave me. And he was very sickly after that. And I handled him with kid gloves. And it was it was very crazy that it happened that way. But I was glad that it happened that way because I was there with him before he you know, before he died. I was there. And I wouldn't have wanted it to be any other way, because even though he was all of these things, he was still very much there. He cooked all the meals. He got you up in the morning. He picked you up if you needed to. He was at the basketball games. He's at the plays. He's, you know, at everything at school. I was protected outside of my household because of the type of person my daddy was. I was not protected inside of my household because of the type of person my daddy was. It's a catch-22. But um, I think, it, yeah, I think it was grace and compassion that that I could give him, that I could give him and that I was happy to give him. But this movie, this movie, as a child, y'all, I, I was watching this over and over again so that I could see resolve, that I could see somebody get out. You know what I'm saying? My dad had to die. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it didn't happen like running off. And there were times when we ran away, when we, you know, had to leave because things got too fucked up. But we always went back and we never went back. You know, it wasn't enough time. I felt like there should have been longer time. He should have had to fix some things first. And that, you know, my mom always had so much sympathy for him. You know, they don't they don't see it as them needing to have sympathy for themselves or for you. But see it for the man. And that's the weirdest thing to me. The weirdest thing, because even after she gets beat like this and taking it right back to the movie, because it all blends. <laughs> after she finished getting bloodied up, Jackie comes into the bedroom and says, somebody need to slap his ass around. She says, why do you keep going through this? You can't keep hiding black eyes from us, pretending like nothing's happening. We know. And she says. She's going to help get things back on track and things between them going to get better. She makes all these excuses for him. All these excuses about what he's going through and how hurt he is. And she isn't even thinking about this. She's sitting there wiping the blood from her face. Where's the sympathy for herself? Where's the care for herself? So later on, after she goes to sleep, he brings in a gift while she's sleeping. I remember one time I got some real nice tennis shoes. <sighs> Thank you, Queen RN 444 for the super chat. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experience. I love the content from your point of view. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad y'all appreciate it because this one is not easy. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I know my dad's background. Um, I know a lot about my dad, which is, you know, I, I know a lot of stuff that, you know, I feel like really matters. Um, and also I feel like I know who my dad was like on a, on an inside level, on an inside level, I understood him. I understood him before I understood my mom. I understood my dad's anger before I understood anything. That was the first lesson I learned was like as an adult, one of the first lessons I learned was the type of anger my dad had on the inside. I felt it. I felt it. And I understood for him, it felt like if I stop being angry, then I'm losing. I'm taking an L if I stop being angry. When I was like in my teens, my late teens, early 20s, I started getting that out of my head that no, I don't want to be mad. I don't like being mad. So stop being mad. Cause I don't want to be mad because it makes me feel tired. Not because I'm losing something. So I had to change that on my own. And it was really because like I, and once I felt that I understood and I was like, he just couldn't figure out how to tell himself that he wasn't losing anything by not being angry. But then also he abused alcohol. So that's another thing that makes it hard for you to control your temperament um, is when you're dependent upon something. 
Voluptuous. Thank you, uh, Shalia. Thank you for the super chat. Sending you a virtual hug. Oh, thank you. I appreciate y'all. I really, really do. So, y'all, after that, they perform Shake a Tail Feather. Now they on TV and shit. Okay. Why well, hurl all the girls looking this and weird all over the neighborhood? Tell me why didn't you ask me, baby? Or did you think I could? Well, I don't ask somebody want to step aside. I see you do the dip, all right. Tell me why didn't you ask me, baby? I'm going to show you how to do it right. 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 I'll twist it. Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, baby. There we go, loop and loop. What a shake it up, baby. Here we go, loop the line. All right, now, uh, oh, bend over. Let me see you shake a tail feather. You been over. Let me see you shake a tail feather. Well, you been over. Let me see you shake a tail feather. Why, you been over. And let me see you do it. Ah, ah, come on, come on, baby. Come on, come on, baby. Do the twist. Do the ah, Y'all know she do the uh, okay, listen. <laughs> You're lucky I have not inputted dance sequences to match this. Okay. But that was an excellent performance. Shake a tail feather was a huge hit. Okay. Bill Spector, creepy ass. Do your research on that motherfucker. Phil Spector wants to work with Tina. Ike comes over there and he's like, oh, Phil, anything you want to say to her, you can say to me. He says, well, I want to do a song with Tina. And he's like, hey, y'all, hey, 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 Phil Spector want to do a song with Ike and Tina. I want to do a song with Tina. Mm. Well, come on, come on, come on back here. Let me talk to you. Come, come talk back to my office. I don't know what the conversation was, but it probably was something similar to when her mama talked to Ike. There was some money exchanging of hands and Tina was able to go to the studio. And baby, child. When I was a little girl, I had a rag doll. Only doll I've ever owned. Now I love you just the way I love that rag doll. But only now my love has grown. And it grows stronger in every way. And it gets deeper, let me say. And it gets higher day by day. And do I love you? I want a river deep, mountain high. Yeah. If I lost you, would I cry? Oh, how I love you, baby, 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 baby. I'm not going to do it, but I love that whole song, okay? I love you, baby, like a violet loves the spring. And I love you, baby, like a... Uh, what a violent love to sing, child. I mess it up. And I love you, baby, like a schoolboy loves his dog. And I love you, baby, river deep, mountain high. Listen, I love that song. <laughs> Phil Spector produced the fuck out of that song, you demon, you. Okay, thank you, Father in the Abyss, for the super sticker. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listen, I love it. When Celine Dion did this song, I was, yeah, no, no, nah, this song with the grit of her vocals, with the with strings, oh my God, it was epic. Like, I love that song. <laughs> Thank you for another super chat, Falling Abyss. I'm so in love with this because that is me every time I, as I say with you, yes, I love y'all. Okay, y'all better feel this with me. Okay. Okay. So 
y'all know that that was one of the biggest songs that she recorded right at the time ike pretends not to be jealous oh no it's all right it's out of sight now oh yeah i ain't lying to you it's out of sight really i yeah yeah go on now <laughs> go in the back so i can do some more cocaine okay and so after that, they go to the diner. And when they go to the diner, they are playing the song on, you know, the radio in the diner. And you can hear him telling them to turn the song off. So over time, he didn't got more and more agitated with the fact that that song blew up the way it did. Right. So some kids come over, some white kids that probably didn't know who Tina was before, but now they know who she is. And she did this song with Phil Spector. So the kids come over, ask for Tina's autograph, and Ike corrects them, uh, corrects them. That's Mrs. Turner. That's the married woman you talk to, boy. Frost says they're supposed to be celebrating. So Ike, because they're about to go on tour with the Rolling Stones, right? So Ike tells them, bring, you know what? Bring that whole cake over here. Bring that whole cake over here, okay? And um, when Tina doesn't want any cake, because Tina is eating ice. I don't know why Tina, you know, uh, shit, I feel good. You know what I'm saying? All right, girl, what's going on right here? <laughs> why you feel good and you ain't got no appetite, Tina? What's going on? But either way, Tina says she didn't want the cake. He said, come on now, I'm asking nice. She said, I'm saying no nice. I don't want the, I don't want the cake. I, Y'all know this. Everybody knows this. Come on, eat the cake. And she was like, anemics eat ice. They do. Oh, I do love eating ice. You're right. Now you're anemic. But that's not. Anyway. <laughs> Shit. So y'all know once he smushed the cake in her face, she threw the ice in his face. And Jackie jumped up to try to stop him from hitting her. Come on, Ike. Please don't do that, Ike. And then because it don't matter who, who, who's in his face. Anybody can get it. He hit Jackie. And Jackie slide back. I mean, they in a diner full of white people, y'all. He don't give a shit. That's how you know he high, okay? So she slide back, motherfucker, fuck you, white. No, that's all right. Fuck you, white. You ain't got to hit me but once, okay? And then what, what Anna said, Jackie, it's all right. With cake all over her face, look like a fool. She was like, it's not all right to let the motherfucker pound on you. And if you had any sense, you get out of here too. And he throws her back and tells her, she, if she had any sense, she get out here. And she tells him to kiss my ass. You a dead woman if you stay here. Jackie meant that shit. And Jackie was not lying. And so they sit back down and Frost is like, just take the cake anime, please. I'm like, Frost, you ain't shit. Frost, you ain't shit. All, <laughs> All of the niggas around ain't shit. Because nobody, it feels like nobody ever stopped him. Nobody ever stopped him from hitting her. Nobody ever stopped him from hitting her. Like, I, child. Anyway, so while they were sleeping, Jackie's words must have hit home. So he was holding on to her, and she rolled over, and he said, where you going? She was like, to the bathroom. But he knew she was trying to leave him. So she gets all of her and the kids shit into a bag and gets them into the car and she's leaving. She calls her mom and she says, mom, can you please not tell Ike I need to leave him? Can I please come and stay with you? She finds out that Ike bought her mama a brand new house that she didn't even know about. So she needed the fucking address to her own mama's house. That mama ain't shit. So she had to stop at a halfway point. She was on a bus. So she stops at, you know, they stop at the little bus stop to get gas, use the bathroom, get something to eat. She go back on the bus and see that the boys aren't there. When she goes back off the bus looking for them, it's pouring rain and outside. She sees Ike is ushering the other three kids into the car. And she says, no, Ike, no. And he says, basically, he called. Your mama told me where you was. You know, they lock people up kidnapping their kids. Hit in the head. Get in the car. Get in the car. I can't tell you how many times I got hit in the head like that. Because <laughs> at one point, I guess it seemed like it was better than smacking me or punching me to hit me upside the head hard as fuck. But yeah, that used to happen to me a lot. Anyway, so yeah, she couldn't leave. Her own mama sold her out. And I've been telling y'all that mama ain't shit. Frost didn't care. Frost was just there for the cocaine and the food, okay? <clears throat> but it's just crazy to me how all of those men were around and none of them ever stopped him from hitting those women. Like, none of them, none of them, just, just as pussy as they want to be. Anyway, I'm sorry, y'all. So she had to go back and then they performed Proud Mary, y'all. So they replaced Jackie 
<clears throat> Darlene is still there. And obviously, Darlene is still sleeping with Ike because when they're on the plane, she got her titties in Ike's face while his legs are on Tina. Ike is still on drugs bad, and Tina has to take care of him. But now we're performing Proud Mary. You know, every now and then, I think you might like to hear something from us. Nice and easy. But see, there's just one thing. We never, ever do nothing nice and easy. We always do it nice and rough. So we're going to take the beginning of the song and do it easy. And then we're going to do the finish rough. That's the way we do. Credence Clearwaters, Proud Mary. And we rolling. Come on, background singers. Rolling. <clears throat> rolling on the river. Listen to the story. Left a good job down in the city. Working for the man every night and day. And I never lost one minute of sleep. And I will worry about the way that things might have been. You know that big wheel just keep on turning. Proud Mary keep on burning. And we're rolling. Rolling, rolling on the river. Claimed a lot of place in Memphis. You know I popped a lot of tang down in Orleans. But I never saw all the goods out of the city until I hitched a ride on the river Bow Queen. Big wheel just keep on turning. Ooh, the proud Mary keep on burning. And we're rolling, rolling, rolling on the river. Rolling on the river. Y'all know we do it, okay? Okay? Okay. I left a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day. And I never lost one minute of sleep and worry about the way the things might have been. Big wheel keep on turning. Proud Mary keep on burning. And we're rolling, rolling, rolling on the river. Rolling, rolling. Rolling on the river. Get up, do 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 If you come down to the river, I bet you're gonna find some people who live. You don't have to worry if you got the money. People on the river all happy to deal. Big wheel keep on turning. Proud Mary, keep on burning. And we're rolling, rolling, rolling on the river. Okay. I'm going to leave y'all alone. Because y'all know I could. Okay, y'all know. Listen. <laughs> we need me to have air. Okay. Oh, Lord. With that being said, like the video. <laughs> in the background hating <clears throat> okay had an afro not <laughs> okay and then they get into the studio for nutbush tennessee a church house get out a 
schoolhouse outhouse. Highway number 19. Well, people keep the city clean. They call it Nutbush. Thank you, Kavan. Oh, Nutbush. They call it Nutbush City Limit. Nutbush City. 25 is the speed limit. Motorcycle not allowed in it. They go to store on Friday. They go to church every Sunday. They call it Nutbush. Oh, Nutbush. They call it Nutbush City Limit. Okay. <laughs> I had to give y'all a light moment because we know it's about to get dark. <laughs> Everybody hates this scene. She was in the studio in their house trying to get this song out. Of course, I can remember the words. Like, I wrote it. Yeah, you wrote the motherfucking song and now you can't even remember the goddamn words? I mean, what the fuck you doing? So what? Y'all think this sound good? Everybody in the house like, yeah, it sound good. No, no, it ain't good. It ain't good till I say it's good. This I can Tina and you gonna sing how I tell you to sing. You gonna sing this motherfucker so you get it right. That's why everybody get out. We need some privacy. And then Frost in the background. Come on, get the fuck out. Everybody get the fuck out. <laughs> I was just like... I need to give them glasses so I can look at that ugly motherfucker. Oh, where you going? This ain't flour. Who didn't get the fuck out? Like somebody was trying to walk out the house with a whole plate of cocaine. <laughs> that nigga said, where the fuck you going? This ain't flour. <laughs> so, you know, at this point, Tina still think it's good. You know what I'm saying? Hey, don't get nothing on you. Hey, all right now. Shit, that mean don't get no cocaine on you because you can get pulled over by the police and then they can see the cocaine on you. All right. Okay, because niggas be in cocaine on them, they be forgetting and dust the cocaine off. <coughs> okay, and so this is the part where we see him. Grape juicer. Beater and grape juicer. And this is when this was like a, you didn't, you know, I thought you couldn't do any worse to me. I think that on some level he was trying to break her spirit. And when he could not break her spirit, he would take it the extra step. And this was the extra step. So after that, <clears throat> Tina started taking volumes. And one day when they was getting ready for a show, she backstage on volume and drawing her eyebrows on. And one of the singers says, you know, this is the girl who used to, who was on Dead Presidents. <laughs> Okay, Darlene, Darlene, something wrong with her, mind you. She and Darlene are sister wives at this point. Darlene, you know, Anna, Anna, what'd you take? Because <clears throat> she's, we gotta go before we miss. Like, she high, she out of it, she ODing. And so they call the ambulance. Ike is in the ambulance with her and they pump in her stomach. And this is when he says, oh, and you better make it. You hear me, bitch, if you don't make it, I'll kill you. And we all just kind of like laugh at those things now. But how crazy is that? For somebody <clears throat> to be being abused to the point where they want to kill themselves. Because that's what that was about. And he said, don't you die on me. You hear me, bitch? If you don't make it, I'll kill you. What the fuck are you even talking about? If she don't make it, she's already dead. Let's start there. But that's the psyche. That you can't even see how bad this is. You can't even see how bad this is. Lisa, thank you for the super chat. Where is your shimmy shimmy dress and wig, Bonnie? Girl, ain't nobody got time for all that. I could barely emotionally get through this one, okay? Y'all gonna have to envision it. <laughs> envision it, okay? So, she ends up in a hospital. And Jackie comes to see her. And Jackie comes in with flowers. And she said, well, this isn't the best way to take a coffee break from Ike. But she tells her, I have a sofa bed and it's yours if you need it. And so after she gets out of the hospital, she has to take a taxi home because everybody else is at her house having a fucking party. So <clears throat> she walks into her house and Ike has Tanya and, you know, he's all into whoever Tanya is. And then Ike Jr. is all into some other woman, barely speaks to his mom when she walks through the door from being in the fucking hospital. Nobody, nobody says anything. She almost died. And she came home and nobody said a fucking thing. Everybody's just sitting around like ain't nothing happened. 
Ike says, you know, next time you're going to take a break, give a nigga some notice. You know what I'm saying? All these hospital bills and it cost me a lot of money and you done went up there and all of that for what? For nothing. Okay. And then he tells her that he needs her to get on uh, the girls for some new routines because they got some shows coming up and he, uh, he needs her to get on the boys because, you know, Michael and Lil Ronnie have been running around here like they didn't lost their mind. Okay. And you, they mama, you need to get after them about their schoolwork. So she's barely in the door. There are hoes walking around in her house as if they live there. Her son is sitting on the sofa acting like she didn't just come home from the fucking hospital. And her husband is telling her about all of the shit he needs for her to do on top of the fact that there's a bitch sitting there, you know, in between his legs. Like, you know, I don't give a fuck. She don't even care. She says, sure, Ike. Sure. He said, all right, good to see you. Kiss on the cheek and walk off. At this point, it's time to go. So she goes to see Jackie in a very fabulous purple suit. <clears throat> and uh, Jackie said, how you doing? She was like, you know, you know, I'm good once I'm on stage. And Jackie says, and when you're not, she says, come on, hey, hey, hey. ain't no such thing as being on stage. Hey, hey. You ain't on stage. <clears throat> you getting ready to go on stage. Hey, 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 hey bitch. Hey, wait, motherfucker. You, you make fun of me? Huh? 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 Bitch, you make fun of me? Huh? Huh? Don't. Bye. Find your ass. See, that's the shit there that I'm talking about. Oh. Next time I might not take your ass to, 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 to the motherfucking hospital, okay? Oh, Ike, I'm sorry, Ike. Am I late for rehearsal? Bitch, Jackie, you late? Bitch, you better be late. Bitch, you gonna be late, goddammit. Jackie, what you doing? <laughs> you make fun of me again? Find your ass. And the moment went from them laughing and making fun of Ike to Tina sitting down and bursting into tears. And Jackie says, oh... Tina, I'm so sorry. That was, she, you know, because she thought they was joking how they always did. And she says, I'm, she said, Jackie, no, I'm just, she says, I know what it's like to have your own blood walk out on you. And I just can't walk out. I just. <laughs> and so Jackie takes her over to the Buddhist table. <clears throat> and she says, you know, I'm going to show you how to chant. She says, I'm a Buddhist now. And when you chant, you see yourself clearly. It's like life's mirror. And when you see yourself clearly, you can change anything. And this is how Jackie teaches her how to chant. I can remember being a child, being in school. And um, I went to a Lutheran school. So they love telling you how everybody else's religion is wrong. And I said, not the Buddhist religion. It helped Tina Turner get in, you know, get away from her abusive marriage. And I remember this woman at my school telling me that's probably why she was in an abuse marriage because of that. I said, no, it actually helped her get out of it because they thought they were saying something smart to me when I said Tina Turner is a Buddhist. You know, she's not a Christian. And that was my, you know, that was my <clears throat> my person at the time. You know, that was my favorite artist ever. And so. When this lady says that to me, I check the fuck out that lady behind it. That's like, and to me, at an early age, I realized that people be wilding about religion, the way they disrespect other people's beliefs in order to uphold their own. I never did like that. Because to me, Buddhism and chanting helped this lady get out of an abusive relationship. Okay? So you can't tell somebody that their religion doesn't work <laughs> if it helped them do what they needed to do. And I get that. You know what I'm saying? But I just kind of feel like looking at it all... I think Buddhist is the most balanced of it all because it's not really a religion. It's more of a practice. Um, to me, in my research of Buddhism, it's different. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Just different from others. It's more about balance, whereas other religions are like, you know, evil versus good, good versus evil, light versus dark. Buddhism, I feel like, teaches you that you need one in order to have the other. And to not look at things like one is evil or one is good, but more so that <clears throat> times are sometimes dark and sometimes are time, you know, are light. And the energy of both of those is needed at different times. You know what I'm saying? Like you need your dark, angry, anger, you know, angry energy sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. Just like you need your light, happy energy sometimes. You need both. To remind me of that episode of Charmed. Anyway, so Dreamer, thank you for the uh, M Dreamer and Random Bits. Thank you for the super chat, Bondi. You are so animated in this review. Love you. Thank you. <clears throat> Duality law. Yes, Buddhism helped Tina gain objectivity and emotional control. When you're living in chaos, you need that in order to help you clear your mind enough to order your footsteps. I know that's right. Come on, talk about it. <clears throat> I'm a practicing Buddhist and it is about duality. It is. It's really about the way you think about things. Um, 
Yep, it is uh, to accept the balance of good and evil. Yes, the understanding of the needing of both of those things. Yeah, it's it's a different <clears throat> a different um ideal from other religions completely to me, but I, I find great value in it. Honestly, it seems the most like right out of all of them. <laughs> I'm gonna just go ahead and tell you because it makes more sense to me. Like Buddhism seems like something that is about practice in real life versus this, you know, um, readying yourself for heaven, which is what most of this stuff feels like to me. You know, act as if you are in heaven so that you'll get to heaven. Whereas Buddhism seems like, let me just show you how to deal with both of these energies, because you're going to have to deal with both of these energies, which is more realistic to me. <clears throat> but you know, another conversation for another time. But that's how we got Nam Yo Renke Kyo. Okay. And so Tina started to chant Nam Yo Renke Kyo. And it doesn't really mean anything, but it was just a way of meditation to me. Like that, that just showed chanting to me is meditation, it's just a way of meditating. And <clears throat> I think that it absolutely works. I think meditation absolutely works and helps people get clarity. Excuse me, y'all. My, my throat getting a little. Y'all know I've been talking for almost two hours. So at, at some point, y'all shit get a little scratchy. Anyway, so yes, Tina starts chanting. And getting a hold of herself emotionally. Y'all remember it was louder than the music at some point. Hey, Frost, turn the record up. <clears throat> and so then we have the airplane scene. Ike is using anime as a pillow and she gets up and walks away. Go straight to hell, Ike. And so when they get off the plane, she's trying to leave him. She's trying to get taxi. And he was like, Where the hell are you going? He's like, I'm going shopping. I'm like, you going shopping? You want to go shopping? Get your ass in the car. So he gets her in the car and he's like, um, you know, why are you acting like that? And she was like, don't start with me. I, I ain't in the mood today. Right? He said, oh, you ain't in the mood? And then he slaps her. Okay. Don't you ever talk to me like that again. Smacks her over and over. Oh, you want to make sure you don't talk to me like that. And then he goes to take his shoe off. He takes his shoe off and he's starting to beat her with his shoe. Y'all, I used to get beat with my daddy slipper <laughs> when I was a kid. Okay. So he starts to you know beat her with the shoe and eventually she uh bites him and then she kicks him off of her and he was caught off guard because she kicked him in the dick and she was like you can't do no better than that you can't do no better than that come on and then she went ahead and beat the hell out of him and then they get to the hotel and they all bloody and everybody sees you know the remnants of their fight and she goes to the desk turner you know do y'all need a nobody no damn doctor what elevator at they go upstairs to the room and he lay down. It's a normal fight we didn't have. Okay, you make, make sure you wake me up before the sound check, yeah? Anime, you hear what I said, woman? Sure, Ike. She goes into the bathroom and she looks at her face. And she is bloody. And like, how am I going on stage with my face swollen like this? And she used to do it, y'all. If you go and look at some of those old TV show performances, she used to go on there with makeup over, like, you know, uh, puffed up eyes and shit. And so this is when she decides to run. And she grabs her bag and she runs across the highway. We all know. You know, I love instrumentals. So she runs across to the other hotel. And they know who she is and they can see her face. And she was like, I don't have any money, but if you please give me a room, I promise you, I will pay you back. She was about to give him the wedding ring off her finger. And the man says, oh, no, Miss Turner, we'll give you a room. Like, I, I feel like they knew she was good for it. <clears throat> so then 1977, she files for divorce. Something that I always remember was watching all of the boys be on her side of the room and Ike Jr. getting up and walking to the other side of the room where his father was sitting. And this is when Tina says, I don't want anything. I just want my name, Your Honor. He was like, if she want to leave, she can leave. But the name got my daddy blood on it. name got my daddy blood on it. Okay, so she want to leave, she can leave, take a country ass home and all of that. But the name stays home. The name stays home. Well, the judge said that if that's all she asking for, if she going to walk out of here with absolutely nothing, Miss Turner will retain the use of her stage name. Okay? And she was happy. That's all she wanted. And she left. 
with nothing because that's how much she wanted to get away from him. But you know what that also left left uh, him with? All of that debt. All of him taking advance money and not making good on it. <clears throat> she paid out her portion of it. She did performances and stuff like that in the late 70s and the early 80s until her career picked up again for doing rock. But let me, you know, get back to my notes. 1980. She's performing at a hotel. They're calling her old timey and grandma at this point. Okay. And, you know, <clears throat> she comes out. You know, they're doing old disco music. Dun, 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 dun. And it, which it ain't even that old yet in 1980. The disco era was the 70s. Okay. Um, but she's singing um, Disco Inferno. To my surprise. 100 stories high, people getting loose now, getting down on the roof, I tell you, right? Fuck screaming, yes, out of control, it was so entertaining, when the boogie starts to explode, I heard somebody say burn, baby, burn. It's going for now. Burn that mother down now. Burn, baby, burn. Mm -hmm. Okay, listen. I just, I love that performance. That performance was dynamic. But anyway, what's clear is that Tina has fans in an excellent stage show, even in the 80s, okay? So she talks to this manager after and tells him that she wants to do rock and roll like Bowie and Mick Jagger. She wants to do fun stuff, not this sad, you know, sad sack stuff she used to do with Ike or the boring shit that she has to do for the hotels. She says it took her a long time, but she's ready and she knows what she wants. So she's leaving rehearsal one night. You know, she got her own band. She's doing a rock thing. OK, we're getting ready to come out with you're simply the best, you know, and all of that. OK, which is now running on T-Mobile commercials like crazy. But anyway, <clears throat> she's leaving rehearsal and Ike shows up. He wants to talk. And she says, I don't think so, Ike. And he brings out some flowers. Look, I got some flowers for you. Come on, come on. Just five minutes. OK. And so she's like, fine, just five minutes. So she, you know, sits down. It's called you try to close. She says, ah, ah, don't close it. Don't you close this door, nigga. So he sit down like, damn, girl, you look good. You smell good, too. What that is. And she was like, come on now, Ike. What you want? And he says, the record company said he owed them money. She says, well, you took a lot of advance money and you didn't make good on it. So I don't know what the fuck you come and talking to me about it for. He said he just needs another hit record. He's been writing and he wrote one song for her, even though he can't remember the song. OK, but he said he got a song real nice. Got that real nice melody that everybody listen to nowadays. And she says, listen, I have my own band and my own songs now. He said, that's cute, but that ain't that ain't like what we had. Come on, now. what we had was strong. She says, look, I got to go because you're trying to downplay what I got going on. I ain't got time for this shit. So she gets up to leave and he says, look, I miss you, all right? I didn't gave up that narcotic, okay? Look, I'm going to try to do right by you this time now, and Come on now. Not I'm going to try to do right by you. Not I'm going to try. No, nigga, don't come to me with try. If you if you feel like all you can do is try, then ain't, ain't nothing you doing for me then. So she said, bye, Ike. And he said, bye, I ain't done talking to you. And then he grabbed her arm. She said, I was wondering when the old Ike Turner was going to show up. And so she get out the car. She slammed that damn car door so hard. It broke the glass. He said, you ain't down the summer. And she broke that fucking door. She broke that window. He said, look, you done fucked up a nice automobile. Okay. <clears throat> He said, this ain't over, anime. You better believe this shit ain't over. And yes, then she's doing her interview. I'm a soul survivor. Dun, 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 dun. So survive. Yes. To me, I feel like the music that Tina was doing back in the day, to me, it, it set the president for rock. All of the shit that they started doing in rock music always sound like they were emulating her voice in the way she would growl in her singing. Thank you, Dequatia. You're doing a great job with the review. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. I'm glad y'all are enjoying it. So <clears throat> Tina is doing a showcase at the Ritz and they do an interview to promote it. And she talks about her Buddhism. And then Ike Jr. shows up to her house, beat up. Okay. Ike Jr. motherfucker. Okay says that his dad kicked him out freaked out 
mad about this performance that she has happening at the Ritz. Anytime anybody mentions it, he threatens her. He says he's got a hit out on her. And so, you know, Ike Jr. is all bloodied and messed up because his daddy didn't fucked him up. I said, see, that's what you get when you slid your ass over to the other side of the courtroom. <clears throat> okay, child. And, and why is it that Private Dancer was my mama and my daddy's song, child? <laughs> anyway, so Ike shows up to her show at the Ritz. And he tells her that she can't, can't get away from me and I'm in here, okay? And then he pulls the gun out. And she said, you know, he said, since you know me so well, what am I going to do now? He pulled out the gun. Doom, 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 doom. They play that music in the background. And she says, that's supposed to scare me. She going to do what I got. I don't know. Do what you want to do. I got. I don't care. But what I know out there is they got a room out there full of people that came to see me. You hear that, Ike? Me. So I don't know what you're going to do. Do whatever you're going to do. What you going to shoot me? Pistol with me? Mm -hmm. And then she got up and walked off and looked at him like wasting my goddamn time before I was getting ready to go out on stage. And they call it down and she go out there and she do that, you know. Okay, you know what I'm doing. You must understand through the touch of your hand makes my balls react. And it's only the thrill for the yearn opposites attract. It's physical, only logical. Must try to ignore that it means more than that. Oh, what's love got to do? Got to do with it. What's love? But a second-hand emotion. What's love got to do? I say got to do with it. Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? It may seem to you that I'm acting confused when you're close to me. And pull up. Then to look dazed, I read it someplace. I've got cost to me. There's a name for it. There's a phrase that fits. But whatever the reason you do it for me, oh, what's love got to do? Got to do with it. What's love? But a sweet old-fashioned notion. What's love got to do? I say got to do with it. Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Listen, but I'm going to tell y'all, the best song is the last song, okay, that they play during the credits. There's a pale moon in the sky that you make your wishes on. Oh, like a light in your eyes, the one I put my dreams upon. It's not there any longer. Something happened somewhere and we both know why. Mm. But me, I'm getting stronger. We must stop pretending I can't live this lie. I don't care who's wrong or right. I don't really want to fight no more. Too much talking, babe. Let's sleep on it tonight. I don't really want to fight no more Cause it's time for letting go Listen Hanging on to the past It only stands in our way We have to go for love but we just grew up oh, I don't want to hurt no more. Okay. 
Listen. Listen. I had to give it to y'all right quick. <laughs> okay. I had to give it to y'all right quick. Okay. But anyway, that's it, y'all. That's it. <laughs> that was the end. If y'all know Tina went on to sing millions of records and be an even bigger act all on her own than she was with Ike. And it's crazy to me because, like, when you think about the, like, huge artists when I was coming up in the early 90s, it was absolutely Whitney Houston, Tina Turner, Michael Jackson, uh, um, Prince, Aretha Franklin. Like, when I think about like huge, you know, cataclysmic type artists, the ones that were really like, you know, hitting them white audiences and selling out those arenas. Tina was definitely number one. And it's so funny because um, one of the one of the things that my parents did do for me is they surprised me one year for my birthday and took me to a Tina Turner concert. I think I was like 13 at the time. But they surprised me and took me to Tina's concert. And I got to see her live and in person when I was very young. Um, and you know, obviously before she got much older. So that was always something that I appreciated that they did for me. So shout out to my people for that. And for a whole bunch of other things, because you know, I, I don't want anybody to feel like it was all bad. It was ever all bad. Cause it wasn't ever all bad. Yeah, R.I.P. Craig, R.I.P. Ike Jr. R.I.P. Ike. You know. He finally got his Grammy years later. Um, but you know, she got a whole bunch of them all on her own. <clears throat> and yes, I saw somebody mention Viola Davis's book earlier and the, the abuse her father, you know, did to her mother. And I read, I'm reading her book right now. So I am listening to it. Um, yes, Tina is the mother of modern rock and roll. To me, she is absolutely, absolutely. All of them, you know, younger dudes and all of that. I feel even some of those older white guys used to mimic the, the, the vocal patterns that she had. But yes, y'all, Tina outlived all of them. She did. Her birthday was last week. Um, so I I love Tina Turner very much so. And when I watched the documentary, it made me sad to feel like she, you know, that she felt like her life was just so bad or so painful because, you know, it gave me so many times I I watched this movie because it made me feel good and I needed to feel good so many times and I feel like she don't even know because I don't think I would have known about her if it were not for the movie because you know I was so young and my people didn't listen to rock music they listened to private dancing and all of that but that was not when I was around child <laughs> yeah Tina's still alive um but she just sold off her whole catalog I think that was last year um you know she's done this whole hall of fame thing she's that girl and she always will be and she yeah helped a lot of people I, I don't think she has any idea but I also understand how isolating how isolating it could be when you are a person that has affected so many people in a good way but you've had to sacrifice personally so much for it um I think I yeah I, I saw the Oprah interview as well um I tell you I watched I watched everything that she's done um, the only thing I didn't read was that very first book because they didn't have that on uh, audio book. And I believe, you know, that just came out like before I was born, I believe, or like really early on. So I just never read it. But I read so many different interviews that she did talking about how things really were. Um, her husband spoke on. I yes, the one that she had, the one that she has now, the one that gave her his kidney and all of that. Um, yeah, I think it's like 16 years her junior. But either way, y'all, yes, um, she lives beautifully. Like the wedding in Switzerland was amazing. Her home there, like she lives a beautiful life now. Um, I just hope that, you know, that's what she feels the most of. But I know when her son uh, committed suicide in 2018, that was very hard for her. Um, so, yeah, I just I felt over the years, Beyonce, I know that's why I love Beyonce so much, because I know that she has those same, you know, um, those same influences that I do as far as Tina Turner is concerned just like I loved Whitney because Whitney grew up loving Sparkle and Sparkle is one of my favorite movies which will probably be um the next one so um you know rest in peace for Irene Cara but yeah y'all um that's all I got I hope y'all enjoyed this I love y'all so much um thank you for giving me a space to talk about this um this was a hard one for me 
Um, I had to, you know, build myself up to this place, but I'm glad I did. Um, thank y'all so much for coming and enjoying it. Make sure y'all like, share, and catch the playback if you were having any issues with the stream. Love y'all, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Ooh, ladies, first panel is, I think it's on Nisi's channel. It's either on Nisi or Jamie's channel. Charlie, it ain't on mine. That's all I know. All right, y'all. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.